The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me beside righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we position ourselves before your word, and we invite you to speak. We come to this place to find rest in your peace. And so would you lead us, Lord? Would you, would you open us to an experience of you in this hour? that would lead to transformation in all hours, in all areas of our life. We trust you to do this, and we're grateful for your presence among us. So speak, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this past Thursday, I, uh, I went to visit my doctor, and he had results from blood work um, for my annual physical, and this isn't like some announcement about my life. <laughs> I, I noticed this morning when I printed it, I should uh, have a little caveat. I'm fine. Uh, everything looked normal. Uh, the good things looked still mostly good, and the, the not so good things, the bad things, still looked not so great. Um, and throughout our conversation, my doctor, as he does every time I see my doctor, uh, asked me questions. Uh, we looked at the results, and he asked me corresponding questions about my life, the rhythm of my life, the practices uh, that move and shape and define my life. What are you eating? How much do you move your body? And how much of that movement would you categorize as exercise? And I'm like, that's a moving target. Uh, I, I do a lot of weight training, picking up my kids, and resistance training, pushing the lawnmower. Um, I don't, I don't think that qualified. Uh, what are you eating? What, how much are you moving? How much are you exercising? What are your stress levels, both good and bad things that add stress to your life? How much are you sleeping, Thomas? How much are you sleeping? How much are you letting yourself rest? And as, he, as we had our conversation, uh, I, didn't, I thought to myself, I don't know why dentists get such a bad rap. All they know, all they ever know is that you're still not flossing. Doctors want to know everything about you, at least, at least the good ones. My, my doctor, with, with irrefutable biological statistics about what is happening in here, was asking questions about the practices and rhythms that define my life. The good things were good, the not so good things were still not so good. And for some of those things that are not so good, the bad things within me, the biological statistics... I simply have to make decisions on who I want to become. And when I look down the road of my life, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, for some things in regard to my physical self, my body, the health and wellness of who I am, the only lever I have to pull is to change the practices and rhythms, the habits around which I arrange my life. Will I eat what my body needs and avoid what harms it? Will I move and move beyond movement into intentional exercise? Will I do that? Will I sleep? Will I let my body stop? Will I let my body rest? And those, the answers to those questions will largely determine who I become. As I look uh, decades into my life. And so that was Thursday, just a, a few days ago. And I went home and I talked to my wife and I said, Eden, this is the moment. This is the day. Everything changes. We just cleaned out the garage. I can work out out there. This is perfect. Uh, we can uh, take, uh, uh, we can change our diet. And so I Googled Mediterranean diet. And every day they're making you this 10-gallon salad. It's just uh, exhausting. Uh, I don't know how you pay for that. Um, 
But we went to the park Thursday morning, and as the kids were up in the playground, I was doing a little workout on the ground. She was sitting on the bench judging me. Uh, it wasn't the time or the place, but I, I got the workout in. Uh, and I've had so much water the last 72 hours. So that was uh, Thursday and Friday. And yesterday, I was driving to Fort Worth. And, and 287 was, was down to one lane, as it is now. Uh, this is forever. And I found myself stuck behind an 18-wheeler. And on the back uh, doors of the 18-wheeler, there were no words, there were no uh, 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 legible um, advertisements. It only had one image, and that image was a 12-foot-tall Oreo cookie <laughs> staring me in the face for 15 minutes. Two days before, the decisions, the habits of your life, you must change. This, who do you want to become? 12-foot Oreo for 15 minutes. And, and all I could think is, I love Oreos. I want to go where that guy's going. <laughs> Less than 48 hours after a life-changing conversation, I'm stuck behind a 12-foot-tall Oreo cookie. We're spending, we're spending time this summer in the 23rd Psalm. We've shared it together. We're, we're hoping to position ourselves in front of it and within it, uh, that it would shape us in a particular way. And we started week one, as, as, as David does, in the writing with the proclamation, the assertion that the Lord is my shepherd. We took on that language. And in week two, we added the corresponding and necessarily subsequent truth for those of whom the Lord is their shepherd shall not want. Another translation, I, I lack nothing. If the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And, and to summarize uh, the last two weeks, uh, there's a pair of ideas that, that are equal and opposite. To be content is, connected, is to be connected with the king. To be content is to be connected with the king. And again, inversely, to be with the king is to be content. It's the invitation and the call of Psalm 23, a reminder of why we're in Psalm 23. As a, as a church, we started the year with an invitation and a call into the practice of Sabbath rest. As we, and as we look to incorporate that practice, we, we, we named it as one day set aside to stop, to rest, to delight and to worship the progression unlocked in the practice. And, and we did, did so recalling the command in Exodus 20, verse 11, to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And the subsequent invitation in Matthew 11 uh, from Jesus, Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. And, and over these months, we, we've named the Oreo cookie trailers that are in front of us, the, the soul fatigue that distracts us from living this life. That our world can only offer discontentment, that we wear busyness as a badge of honor, that everything steers us away from rest. But we want to arrange our life in a particular way that we believe scripture and God invite us to, the way of Jesus, the practice of Sabbath rest. One day each week to stop, to rest, to delight, and to worship, and we believe that this practice will enable us to do which we can, that which we cannot do now through trying, namely stopping, resting, delighting, and worshiping. And so just as practices of diet and exercise shape who we become in our physical health in this body, this family of faith, we want to arrange our collective life around practices that, that form us in a particular way under the lordship of the shepherd and the way of Jesus. But we know that, that this isn't uh, instant wisdom that we can check, yes, I agree, and we receive and we live happily ever after. Over these uh, six months, maybe this invitation, we, we've shared this uh, understanding before, maybe this invitation to the practice has just sounded like wishful thinking or hopeful, what you wish to be true of your life. Which isn't surprising if you've tried anything, if you've tried to incorporate anything new into your life, to learn a new skill, art, sports, communicating, making money, caring for our health. It never comes easy at the beginning. Things are, are easily started but uh, difficult to finish. 
easy to start, hard to follow through on. And we're not exempt from this reality in the kingdom of God. When we look to the practices we're invited to as people of faith, there's, there's nothing to do beside this, to submit ourselves to this reality of human life. That to learn a new way, to establish new habits mean to, means to submit to the rigor of discipline, to take it on which, and, and to trust that it is by way of discipline that we find the easy yoke and the full joy of Christ. We're not exceptions to the rule. That we could somehow know the power and the potential of life in the kingdom without orienting our life around the practices that help us to receive from Jesus. And so we look to Psalm 23, a claim of who God is and who we are in relation to that God. The Lord is my shepherd. I will follow this shepherd. And in following, I'll be called to a new way of life a new rhythm, a new practice, and a new potential for power that we would receive in not, not, not power that we would be puffed up, but out of a sense that without it, we're dead. We're asleep and we need to be brought back to life, to full and abundant life. And so this week, uh, we're, we're moving to, to verse two. I know, calm down, we're moving a little quick. Uh, verse two, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And, and when we first read it, it seems to flow. It seems to make sense. The Lord is my shepherd. Okay, we're talking sheep. So pasture makes sense. He, he makes me lie down. But, but I don't know that much about sheep. I don't know if you do. Um, why does the shepherd have to make them lie down? What is David saying? Remember, shepherd boy turned king. What what is he communicating about the sheep and their relationship to the shepherd? And maybe, maybe the question isn't uh, why does the shepherd make the sheep lay down, but how? There's a, a shepherd turned pastor named Philip Keller that, that wrote a, a short book about the psalm, and, and he, he knows about sheep, so we'll trust his word. He, he shared that there are four requirements in the life and the existence of sheep that have to be met for them to be made to lie down. Otherwise, it's nearly impossible. Stubborn animals. And the first is that the sheep need fear removed. The sheep need their fear removed. Fun sheep fact that I learned this week. Uh, sheep only sleep for about four hours over the course of a 24-hour period. And that, uh, I just remember there's some FFA people in the room. So you all probably need to correct me on some of this, I'm sure. The mic's all yours. <laughs> the sheep only sleep for about four hours a day, and it's in fits and starts. And they'll, they'll sleep standing up. Why do they do this? Because they're terrified, they're timid, they're skittish animals, helpless and defenseless against predators, wolves and dogs and uh, lions and bears and uh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Uh, they're afraid and so they sleep with an awareness that they're in danger. They sleep in the fold of fear and, and when one sheep is spooked, others will run with it. Even if they haven't seen what caused it, blindly following. I, I, I've, I've garnered a reputation around the church that if you come around a corner, even if you're not trying to scare me, I will be scared. Um, and so when I think of a skittish sheep, I think of a haunted house experience. Awful human invention. Uh, whether you're in the front, I am in the front, the back, or the middle. If someone is spooked, I'm taking off. I'm getting out of there. I don't know why I got in there in the first place. Similarly, within my spirit, within my mind and my, in my uh, heart, if I'm, even if I'm not involved, if I hear of something, news and social media to be afraid of, my heart will follow that path. I will run down uh, the road of fear. And, and, and what happens for me and for you when you lay down to sleep, when your head hits the pillow, how many of your minds begin to run? things I'm worried about, things you're anxious or fearful of, what will happen because of what I said, because of what I did, what has happened, what do they think of that, what do they think of me, and for us and for the sheep, they can sleep only when they see the shepherd. Remember the truth that John 10 tells us about who the shepherd is. Jesus shares these words, I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep. Then the wolf attacks and the flock attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. I lay down my life for the sheep. Those who can see their shepherd can say as Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When our minds begin to run, for those who can see the shepherd, we can claim these words. In the Christian life, there's no substitute for awareness that the shepherd is nearby. We've talked in the last few months uh, again and again of, of the Genesis 3 moment. This moment when, when God and, and humans were, were dwelling together in, in the garden and when they chose to walk without him, he, he, he walked to find them. And he asked the question, where are you? And what we've said over these months is it isn't a geographical question. He knew where they were. Is a relational question. Where are you in relationship to me? I see you. Do you see me? And the unknown, the unexpected, that which can produce panic in us. We struggle to rest in the face of what we don't know. We sleep standing up so we can keep working. What if I don't have enough tomorrow? What if I haven't done enough today? And this is no real rest at all. But Christ's presence, the presence of the shepherd, when we can see him, things change. Psalm 4 begins with these words, Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. And the psalmist ends in this way. In peace, I will lay down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. The movement, the progression of a life lived in view of the good shepherd. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the assurance that leads to drooling on your pillow kind of rest. Like, what, what, what happened? Where have I been? It's the invitation for those who are in sight of the shepherd. So first, they need their fear removed, and second, they need friction resolved. And, and what I mean uh, by friction resolved, I, I don't talk about sheep a lot uh, as you're learning, but when I do and when you do, I assume you're talking about sheep, like a bunch of sheep. And another fun sheep fact that I learned uh, this week is that a group of sheep can be f called a flock, a herd, a trip, or this is fun, a mob. A mob of sheep. That's the one I prefer, but it seems most antithetical to who the sheep are. Um, the sheep, when we think about sheep, we think of them together, and that's, that's not by mistake. That's because they're communal animals. They, and within any herd or pride or colony, the sheep, like any other, jockey for position. Each wants to find the best food to claim the highest and driest ground, the best positioning, and so they become arrogant and domineering. And when one sheep bullies another for position, everyone below them adopts those tactics to protect themselves, the highest and driest, the best. They become edgy and tense and violent, struggle for status, self-assertion, self-recognition, hurt, jealousy, hatred, ambition, competition, jockeying, arrogance, domineering, edgy, tense, violence. These are words that echo into our experience the worst hurt from and against one another. But for the sheep and for us, when the shepherd shows up, the striving ceases. In our relationships, when we become aware of the presence of the shepherd, we see people differently. Our selfish rivalries end and our vision of who they are is different. No longer are they the, the annoying uh, server who, who brought out the wrong plate of food. They're a child of God who didn't want to go to work that day, who's exhausted from being on their feet all day, who also didn't want to people today. This was not their vision of, of uh, a full life. And we have to live with others. I'm sorry. 
if you're laughing, you take that one. Uh, we have to live with people, I'm sorry, but God invites us to not only live with, but to love them. How we get along with people says a lot about where we are resting, where we find our rest, our own security. Again, if I am aware God is with me and I am aware that God is with you, I will treat you differently. I will follow the way of love instead of, I don't know if this fits, but it's funny. Instead of uh, being annoyed at traffic in front of you, you will acknowledge that you yourself are traffic for someone behind you. Think about it. You are someone else's problem. And so how we relate is essential, especially in the body of Christ. The temptation in the Christian community is to see others the same way the world sees them. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, no, we do so no longer. To be close to him, aware of his presence, is to be set free from fear. And largely that's fear of others. And set free from fear, we're, we're uh, allowed to love. The sheep can sleep when they see their shepherd, and when my eyes are on the shepherd, they're not on other sheep. The third thing sheep need to be made, made to lie down is freedom from pests. Of course, they're worried about wolves and bears and predators that threaten their lives, but when the sheep are covered by pests, by flies and, and fleas and parasites. They can't rest. They stomp their feet. They shake their heads. They, they rub into, into bushes to shake what is bothering them. But the image of the shepherd is one who is present enough to see their discomfort, to notice the rhythm and the movements of their body, to, to dip them in water, to wash them, to remove the pests, the flies, the fleas. He's concerned not only for their life, but the quality of their life, the comfort of their life. And he's close enough to recognize the discomfort of their life. I've mentioned before uh, this, this question, how, how do we, those here in the body of believers, how do we help people ask and answer questions about their souls, how they're really doing? How do you uh, address that question in your own life? How am I doing? How is it with my soul? And the, the answer is this, that one at a time we listen and we ask one another, Acknowledging that we're in the presence of the shepherd as we, as we talk, we ask, what's bothering you? What a transformational question to acknowledge those places of discomfort in our life. And so I ask you today, uh, if, if, I've, if I've asked you before, I ask you again, what's bothering you? What is bothering you? This is a spiritual question because one of the primary functions of the spirit is to comfort to meet you in discomfort and to lead you out of it. John 14, 16 promises, I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The word advocate can be translated as comforter. It's who the Spirit is. These are the words of Jesus to his friends. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to send uh, the Spirit to be with you. And uh, in the face of frustration and futility, you can be found in him. Peace and, and patience can be found in him. When we bring what is bothering us to God, uh, he comes to comfort us. The serenity prayer, you, you may know it, is an invitation for the spirit to, that we would accept the things we cannot change, that we would have the courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. The spirit does this in a serenity is part of what the spirit does. It's an invitation from the shepherd. And lastly, fourthly, uh, the sheep need food in their stomachs. They need fear removed, friction removed, freedom from pests, and food in their stomach. This isn't a fun sheep fact, but just a logistical question. What kind of sheep lays down? It's a full sheep. It's a fed sheep. If, if, they're, if they're still hungry, they will still move. 
I, I have a picture from, from 2016. Um, this is in the northern part of Israel. Uh, and I didn't know I had this on my phone, but I have a picture of sheep in Israel on my phone uh, that I took. Uh, so that's cool. Um, but this is the far north part of the country. Well, again, the setting in which Psalm 23 is read, but the setting specifically for, for David as a, as a shepherd uh, near Bethlehem, as you move south towards Jerusalem and Bethlehem, uh, what we f see is green turns brown. And so for a sheep to be full, you can see the work necessary. For the shepherd uh, to do green pastures when it happened by chance in this place. They were pro a product of a lot of labor. If the shepherd's uh, sheep are going to enjoy green pastures, they can either move to the north or the shepherd's going to do a lot of work. Shepherd's going to do a lot of work. He's going to clear out the rock. He's going to tear out the roots. He's going to break up the hard ground. He's going to sow seeds, water, and tend, and care, and cultivate, all in the hope that a place would be prepared for a sheep. This is the role of the shepherd, that they would be fed, that they would be full, that they could lie down. We live afraid, tense, bothered, hurried, hungry, not seeing that the shepherd has already done this work. His concern for our care is beyond comprehension. And this, this vision of a life of stopping, resting, delighting, and worship, it's the best response we could have. For the work the shepherd has done to prepare a place where fear is removed, where friction is resolved, where we are comforted and fed, and most importantly, where the shepherd can be seen. The shepherd is with us. He makes a place for us if we would follow. If we would claim allegiance within his fold. But the Oreo cookie 18-wheeler drives on in front of us. And, and this life, this life of rest, of provision and protection in the shepherd is something few of us ever fully enjoy. Maybe you've known a saint who just oozes patience whose rhythm is restful. Sitting with them is, and talking with them, having a conversation is like taking a, a, a good nap. And, but we, we steer clear. We make quick excuses for, for why we cannot live this life of simply seeing our shepherd and lying down in the pasture prepared for us. This difficulty is largely out of the difficulty of finding Christ in the familiar, of seeing God in our daily lives. But this is what needs to be done. The central task for the sheep and for us is to look for the shepherd. If we want the peace of the sheep, we must recognize the presence of the shepherd. So I want to invite you uh, today and, and this week to the practice of seeing that the shepherd is with you. I want to invite you to the practice of seeing that the shepherd is with you. Remember the question, Genesis 3, where are you? It's a question of God to his created. But I would invite you as the created, the son and the daughter of the king, to ask the question of him, where are you, God? Not a question of doubt that we might not find him, but out of the belief that he's present. As you drive to work, as you drop off and pick up your kids from this camp and that camp and the next camp, as you're on vacation, as you're in the gym, where are you, God? While I'm being someone else's traffic, while I'm caring for aging parents, while I don't know what to do next, where are you, God? To put, it, to put it more fully, this question of where are you, God, uh, how many moments, think of it this way, how many moments of your life each day can you fill with conscious awareness and surrender, not simply to know, but to submit to God's presence? Would you make this the goal of your days? More, more and above your to-do lists, would this be the goal of your day, to become aware and to surrender, to submit to the shepherd's presence in your life. You can go through your days fearful and frustrated, hungry and hurried, or you can surrender. 
in awareness and trust of the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And this kind of life begins with the practice of seeing the shepherd. If we would look, would you pray with me? Father God, you, you create space for us to rest, and we thank you, we praise you, that it is easy here, that within these walls we can breathe deep, that your presence is, is felt and experienced and in warmth and in singing and the sharing of your scripture but we want to locate you in the familiar, the mundane moments of our life. We want to take on the central task of your sheep to look for you, our shepherd. And in looking, we trust that we would find, that you would bring comfort in our discomfort, that you would remove fear and friction, that you would restore relationships that you would feed us, that we would lack nothing in your presence, that you've prepared that place. And so where are you, God? Would you open our eyes to see? Would you fill our days with awareness, submission, and surrender to you, our shepherd? I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.